And a good afternoon to everybody and welcome to another edition of Real Talks. My name is David Steele, where I cover movies new and old and talk about why they are so good. So this past year, I've been doing retrospectives and once a month, I do a perfect movie series and that's what we're going to do today. So um, I just wanted to let everybody know, uh, first and foremost, thank you guys for sticking with me because I know I have a job. And I'm going to get to memberships much later in the show. So you guys don't have to worry about money right now. Uh, me talking about that. But I will just say that I, I have been busy. Okay. I have been watching movies. I have been taking lots of notes. Okay. Um, right here, my notes. So um, I just sat down and watched the, our film that we're going to be doing. And I say our because I have a guest with me. And um, so, yeah, I have a regular job, guys. And I know I should be putting this stuff out on a regular con on a regular basis for you guys, but you know, life happens. Anyways, all of that being said, um, yeah. So I, I just want to say thank you very much because I know I have been putting out content as much as I should, and I do not either a want to lose you guys, you know, and have you guys unsubscribe because of that, or b just get bored. So. Just know that I'm always thinking about this stuff. Just know that I'm always thinking about stuff to improve the, the channel and the content and everything else. Okay. All of that being said, um, so as I said at the top, every single month on the channel, one thing that distinguishes me from everybody else, I'd like to think they do, is that I have what I call a, quote, perfect movie series. Now, these are films that, are either critically acclaimed or they're widely approved of and you know whether it's the acting or the directing or whatever it is and th these are now truth be told film is subjective so you know if you made like a film that somebody else didn't okay but these are all so films i've covered are things like the dark knight silence of the lambs the social network these are all fantastic movies so i mean i just did um skyfall last month so i mean that, that tells you something right uh it wasn't because of the money either and you guys can go back and watch that review and i'll just put the little thing right up there for you guys to go and do that so the reason here is an at the beginning of every month i like to do that so just to kick it off just to give you guys a fresh new perspective so this month i was thinking about what should we do and I have another movie that I love and, you know, I've seen multiple times. And it's one of those films, guys, that when I sit down and I see it on TV, well, not on TV because I won't watch it edited. But when I see it, I'll sit down and watch the whole thing. And I'm talking about The Departed. This is a remarkable film in so many different ways. Okay. Now, to start out, this didn't... now. Anybody who has seen The Departed, by the way, I should say this outright, and I didn't put this in the, the title, there will be spoilers. So if you haven't, by the way, this is a 15-year-old film, more than 15-year-old film, so if you haven't seen it, okay. But nonetheless, uh, truth be told, this is this didn't blow up the, the movie market, okay? This, this didn't blow up the box office. So anybody who knows, and this is directed by one of, I think, the, the top five, four or five directors you could put on Mount Everest, um, or Mount Rushmore, rather. I don't know why it came out with Mount Everest, but Mount Rushmore of all time. I mean, I think it's Spielberg. I think it's Scorsese. You know, I think it's Coppola, and then you could put in a Cameron or whoever you wanted. Nonetheless, this is it from a director that, I mean, he gave us Goodfellas. He's given us Casino. He's given us Mean Streets. This is the same guy that did you know, of course, re most recently did Kills the Flower Moon. Um, you know, I mean, he's done so many good films. And this was a film that was made all the way back in the mid-2000s. And once again, it didn't blow up for any huge amount of money. Okay, this only, and I say only, and guys, I'm starting to get away from box office, but I just want to, I'm doing a little bit of backstory for you guys to let you know where it was back then and where it is today. So, I mean, this only came out with a $26.5 million opening weekend and ended up making $133 million in the States here. 
this only went on to gross a little over $292 million total worldwide. This isn't the kind of movie that you're going to go watch for anything else. Nonetheless, the cast is stacked. The story is great. And because of that, this actually ended up, believe it or not, guys, ended up cleaning up the Oscars. Okay, so it ended up getting five Oscar nominations. Picture, best picture, which it ended up winning. Believe it or not, Mark's, Mark Wahlberg, okay, who's not pictured there, but in the film, got best supporting actor. Martin Scorsese ended up winning his, finally getting his best director Oscar for this film, okay. Best editing, okay, and best adapted screenplay. And so those it ended up winning four of the five. So Wahlberg was the one that didn't win. Well, let's go back to this, and now I'll figure out what's going on there. But you had three of the big biggest names in the business, right? Okay. You had Leonardo DiCaprio, who, who was still there, okay, as a big name. You had Matt Damon, who was just a superstar at that point. And then you had one of the greatest actors of all time. And Jack Nicholson. I mean, one flew over the cuckoo's nest, a few good men. I mean, you know, it, it just, it runs, his name is synonymous with good acting. I mean, the man's got three Academy Awards, two or three. Anyways, um, so you had to have the right story. So I said it won four Oscars, okay? As I said, director, picture, it did win original, it did win adapted screenplay that year. And we'll bring in my guest here in a minute, and he'll talk a little more about that. And that was an interesting little thing. And it, I should make note of one more thing before we get started. This is a remake. So that all being said, Scorsese is not the type of person to do remakes. On occasion, he will. On occasion, he'll do adapted stuff. So with all of that being said, um, let's bring in my guest here, uh, Matthew Anderson. Hello, Matthew. Um, so how are you doing today? Hello. Well, already I got to disagree with you on one element. Uh, you said that this wasn't a big of a uh, box office hit. I disagree. I think worldwide. Oh, hello, by the way. Um, thanks for having me on the show. <laughs> you, already, you're very welcome. No, no, no. Well, I'm glad um, to have you back. But, uh, well, yeah, because the moment you said you were going to do The Departed, I'm like, I got to text David and tell him, I'm like, I, I want to be in on this. If this were any other movie like the Marvel stuff or some of the other <laughs> films you've done, I'm like, yeah, we'll see. But then, like, The Departed, I'm like, nah, I need to be on this, especially when we just got out of an Oscar season where a certain another director who was long overdue for his Oscar win finally got it. Um, and by the way, he's anyways, talking about Christopher Nolan, guys. Yep, yep. If you yeah. haven't gone to see Oppenheimer, I'm just going to let you get go guys know right now. If you haven't seen Oppenheimer, either rent it on VOD or find it somewhere. It's an amazing movie and Nolan finally did get his Oscar, so continue. Yeah. So anyway, so go back to The Departed. So um I'm not sure uh like I said, I I don't know where, where where why you you're under the assumption this wasn't a box office hit because this is actually one of the few hits that Scorsese had on his hands financially, at least um, in fact, currently right now his highest grossing film is the Wolf of wall street, um, which is nuts, honestly, but that is crazy. And, and, and the budget on this movie, I'm not sure if you already mentioned this, the budget on this was $90 million. Right. And half of that was because it went to the actor salaries like Leonardo DiCaprio, Matt Damon, Jack Nicholson, Mark Wahlberg, and yet this this did become a financial hit and we we will definitely get into some of the reasons as to why this became the film square says he got his oscar uh as opposed to some of his other films because i have some theories that i'm not sure you'll agree or disagree with me on um but yeah and and i and even last night after i was rewatching it again for the show i i didn't even piece together as to why like, because I was, because I think a lot of us collectively as Oscar predictors, even some other people who I've been hearing and listening to, and they're like, "How the hell did like out of the entire ensemble, Mark Wahlberg become the one to be that supporting actor contender?" I have a theory, but we'll get to that down the road. Um, but uh, yeah, I I will. I, yeah, but go ahead. So something about this film that. 
you may, and one of the big things, and guys, if you've seen the film, you know, but what in me doing my research about this, and I kind of knew about it, but I didn't know about it. So anybody who has seen the film or is aware of it, the exes. Now, yes. so this is the thing about the exes. So I did, so I, I read about this last night. This was actually inspired by Howard Hawks's 1932 Scarface. Yep. And Scarface wanted to actually play an homage to him. And if you noticed, okay, and if you've seen the film countless times, you'll know. But there are 12 examples, I'm sorry, yes, 12 examples there of exes throughout the film. And At least basically 12. what that is doing is foreshadowing death. And every single one of those characters you see in one way or the other, and there's, you know, I mean, you have the top right there with the uh, the envelope and everything else, but every single one of those characters dies. Yeah. Every single one of them in some and way, if, shape, or form. Yeah, and if and if the characters aren't dead within the next, like, couple minutes, then they're about to kill someone in the next couple right. minutes. And um, that goes back to Speaking of, and we're going to jump, and guys, I said this was spoiler and late, so. Yeah, you know, it, it, yeah this if is. If you guys, is, if, if you haven't yeah, seen The Departed by the, now, the, you're, you're This is almost out. 20 years old. The film's about to get a 4K release soon. If you haven't seen it, I don't know why you haven't, and you're watching the video. <laughs> okay. Um, the twist. Anyway. Yeah. Um, You know, so Billy is going to go take in. Colin, basically, that's a whole thing in itself, and we'll get to that in a couple minutes, but, like, mm -hmm. this happened so fast within two yeah. minutes. And, I mean, you know, I mean, one of the guys, actually, believe it or not, he was from Prison Break. Not that I watched the show, but I did recognize the actor anyways. But, he, he you know, the, the elevator door opens. Boom! And the guy says, you know, do you think he, you know, he was the only one he had with in the state mm -hmm. police? So, because you, you never saw the guy or very rarely. Okay. And usually that's an indicator of somebody who's going to pop up later on in the film. Nonetheless, he pops Leo's character. He's like, oh, okay. Anthony Edwards gets popped. And then, Anthony you know, Anderson, once yeah. he gets in the handcuff, he, he just pops him. And it's so quick. I mean, it all happened within a 45-second thing. You look, whoa. Yeah. And that was kind of a twist in itself. Um, but, yeah, I mean, and that's the other thing, too. When you go back and, and look at the X, right? We were just talking about the Xs. This is the elevator scene right here. Yeah. And he's coming with down, the, you know. With the, there's like a black piece of pit tape, if anyone could see, in exactly. between Damon and DiCaprio's heads in the elevator. So... Yeah, and it's just it's one of those things where, yeah, it just happens pretty quick. Um, but yeah. one thing, one of the question I want to ask before you go any further into this, because we could do a whole discussion on this even longer than an hour. We probably won't. Um, have you seen the original film that this is no based Internal off Affairs? I've not Infernal Affairs. No. I have. Um, yeah, you own I've, it. I, I own it. I I got it for Christmas. I think about a couple of years ago. And I had seen it finally in film class to Stevenson. And when I finally saw it, I was like, ooh, all right, perfect. We're gonna I'm gonna finally see what what the original film is about or, or like how it how it compares to the to the departed. I could tell you this. I enjoy Infernal Affairs, and for the record, I, I would recommend it for anyone out there to, to watch it because it, it is stylistically it's very different from the departed even though it is a very similar it's extremely similar in terms of the story beats that they have but there are enough differences in the film that could stand on its own this film and infernal affairs i think the big the two biggest changes i remembered uh scorsese and his team uh you know william monahan wrote the script as well and they got an oscar uh the two biggest differences i could remember at the top of my head because it's been so long since I've seen it, but the two differences I remembered between this and Infernal Affairs, The Departed uh, adds in uh, an extra hour of the, the first hour of the film is not in Infernal Affairs. It's, you know, because in The Departed, you're setting up uh, Billy Costigan 
and uh and, and Matt Damon's character uh I, I'm blanking on his on his character's Colin. name Colin is his Colin. name uh, uh, Colin and we're establishing those two characters about how similar they are but also on the different sides of the force just like Infernal Affairs is and we're also establishing uh the Frank Costello character as well along with how crazed he is as a character and we even go through the details of what it takes for DiCaprio's character, uh, Billy, to get into his gang, uh, into Frank's gang, and be like an undercover informant, which it, it's not as easy as it looks when you see in The Departed. Um, and where the Infernal Affairs movie starts is actually right in the middle of the Chinese uh, deal that's going down, that goes wrong. Um, so that's where Infernal Affairs starts. And when... I had seen the film for the first time at Stevenson. That caught me by surprise because I really was expecting like, how the hell are they going to cram in? Because I think the film is like 100 minutes long, maybe under it's two hours. It's two, it's two hours and 34 minutes. Well, well, I was talking about Infernal Affairs. Like, oh, that's oh like an hour, okay, okay. Yeah, that one's like an hour and a half, hour and 40 minutes long. And I thought to myself, how are we going to squeeze so much of like character development uh, or at least what made The, the Departed so interesting? And it, it, it doesn't have the it doesn't have nearly as much development. Like we do get pieces of information as we go along. Um, but that that's really the biggest thing, the biggest difference between the two of them. The other big difference is that um, you know, a lot of people are thinking to themselves, because I, I know there's some people out there, including myself, who are like, Yeah, well, I was Yuki about to bring here, it up. Mark well, Wahlberg's Yuki character says, does yeah. He oh, does go, not, go ahead. And and yeah, he, he just said it. His the character, Mark Wahlberg does, not character exist. does not exist. Yeah, he does not exist in Infernal Affairs. That immediately disappointed me right off the bat because I love – I don't know if you have a still a Mark Wahlberg here in the movie, but I think that character <laughs> – I, I love that character so much because it's such a – like he, but that character is such a steam stealer, and I love the, the snarky comments that he makes throughout the films. And what's even funny is that when they got Mark Wahlberg on to do the film – uh, if you don't mind me doing your job for yeah, a minute, go David. Ahead. Uh, they, uh, he had re uh, rejected the film so many times in terms of the script, even though it was a, a really good part. And he wanted to, there was another role that he wanted to play. And it wasn't until his agent persuaded Mark Wahlberg to say, look, man, like, you know, these characters from the back of your hand, if anything, you're the cop that, you know, you're, if anything, you're going to be the cop that essentially, arrested your younger self when you were you know a rambunctious teen uh back in the day and and so mark Wahlberg's like all right fine i'll do it and the reason why he has that like shitty looking hair that he has in the film and mm -hmm. not his usual uh uh you know short yeah, hair that he usually yeah. has it's because he wanted to grow the hair for um the vince papali film the invincibles um that's why he had the long hair growing and why it looked like a mess um but yeah, uh, but yeah, yeah but the, 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 the moment I found out about him not being in the movie, I'm like, oh, damn it. Um, but I, I would still recommend the original film, Infernal Affairs, if you get a chance. I think, again, it does the job of what The Departed does, but it off it's more of a style over substance movie, and it, it's very much Hong Kong cinema. Like, Hong, the way that uh, uh, the Hong Kong audiences and international audiences will like a certain film, but American audiences won't. Um, they have very different tastes. Like uh, another film, for example, that did really well internationally was Warcraft. That did really well internationally. Uh, it's, I think, especially in China, but in the United States, it flat out bombed. So yeah. it's it's it, so I, I would recommend people to watch both the the Departed and Infernal Affairs when they get the chance because it's a, a really interesting co uh, compare and contrast. Even though they are essentially the same story told, but just in different manners. Yeah. So here, here we have the whole cast. Uh, I mean, I know yeah. we were just talking about a few, but you, have, which you were just talking about. So anybody who doesn't, one reason why this works so well is because you have Mark Wahlberg and Matt Damon, who are originally from Boston. Yeah. So they are, they know the game. They, they, they grew up there. They've lived there their whole lives. Okay. So you have Wahlberg on the far left, Alec Baldwin. Okay. You have the director, Martin Scorsese. What did you think about her character, uh, Vera, Vera Farmiga? Yeah, Farmiga. What did you think about her character and how they? I, she. Uh, I remember the funny thing is, is that I actually forgot her character in The Departed. 
is essentially a combined character of the two characters that were in Infernal Affairs. Because in mm-hmm. Infernal Affairs, uh, DiCaprio's character in that film does have a therapist and does form a bit of a bond with her. And Damon also has his own wife slash fiance in the film, but they're two separate characters. And I do think that having the two combined into one, it does allow sort of a bit of a flowing narrative to uh, to both so- to both of those characters a lot more easier, especially when we get to the finale of the film. It ties in a lot easier than uh, um, than what Infernal Affairs had. Um, excuse me, sorry. And and, and I, I do think that her character is is fine, like fine in terms of the writing involved. I do think Vera Farmiga is, you know, she is a capable actress. And, you know, at this point in her career, this was technically, I believe, like her breakout role, so to speak, mm-hmm. because she had she had a couple of films here and there. Like, I think the biggest one outside of this maybe was like Running Scared, which just came out that year and was a box office flop, though. Um, and uh well, Yuki says that the, yeah. the character had tons more development in the American version. Would you say that that's yeah. true? Uh, yeah, she does. I, I, yeah, like he, she does. I, I just, I, I do feel a little bit conflicted with the character, though, only because I, I have heard complaints about how Scorsese, especially in in the more recent films, uh, or at least uh, in the last couple films, he doesn't really put the female characters in the forefront as much as, uh you know like it would have been much more interesting to have them in the forefront but for this kind of story it it makes sense for vera formiga to only be like a supporting role to the whole uh ensemble um but yeah i but but she does a good job uh if yeah. anything she 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 has shown tra- uh uh range as an actress and she's gone on after this to get nominated for up in the air and she was also in the conjuring franchise as well and so yeah she is a capable actress so yeah, um, of course you have Matt Damon next yep. to her, next to her, and then of course Leonardo DiCaprio, young Leonardo DiCaprio next to him. Uh, this is crazy that this was <laughs> seventeen years ago, but it was yeah. I mean, so I mean, it was like you said, it was a stacked cast, and so I, that that had something to do with it too. Um, I have a yeah, I have so, a confession to make yeah. about DiCaprio. Okay. Um, I didn't realize this until looking back that i up before the departed and blood diamond because he also had both of those films out that year Mm -hmm. i was very hot and cold on dicaprio as an actor i think there are there are some roles that he did like pre the departed blood diamond era that i think he's quite good in uh catch me if you can he fits perfectly for titanic you know he fits the lead pretty well um but in stuff like gangs in new york and it's been so long since I've seen the aviator. I just do not find him to be that like, it's very much try hard uh, acting. And it's, it's not, it, it's, it's not really the, t- like he's very much miscast in those types, in those other types of roles. Um, and yet this is the first one of Scorsese's directed films that he's had with, you know, DiCaprio where I thought, Oh, DiCaprio actually fits the role really well here. And he's actually quite good in the movie. Uh, it actually might be one of his be- uh, best performances of his career, in my opinion. But yeah. he is really good in the role, and and even his stuff. Um, I I know a lot of people had issue with the accent that he had in uh, Blood Diamond, but even in that role, I thought he's actually pretty good in this. From, for at least it'd been so long since I last seen it, but yeah. But and it's it's funny, yeah. DiCaprio is like no longer in that phase for me where he's like very like hot or cold on like he you know there's some roles he aces some he doesn't and then nowadays it's like you know timothy chalamet kind of fills that uh uh that totem pole so to speak yeah um so one thing i noticed really really early on is that you have a big juxtaposition okay billy especially when they're talking with their you know martin sheen's character but more importantly you see one who is in a criminal, his family is criminals. And that's where, you know, he's getting berated by Mark Wahlberg's character and everything else, talking about his family and everything else. And one is kind of, you know, as they, as one of somebody else put it, upper middle class. Yeah. And so, I mean, he made plain clothes 
detective really quickly. He was look. He was one of the big things is he wanted to look at the state house, and that was prominently displayed throughout the whole. I mean, the city of Boston was used well. I wouldn't say it was done as well as let's say heat or collateral, but it was done very well. And that all being said, one of the major shots was the state house. So when he had that apartment and you saw, you know, the hardwood floors and it was the marble counters, he knew there was a juxtaposition there between Matt Damon's character and uh, Leo's character. And so the you other had thing the too, upper class and the lower class, yeah. so to speak. I don't want to say lower, but you understand what I mean. Criminal. I know. Class. Um, the the other thing too that adds to Damon's character is that we learn from the beginning, like these are his like wants and desires. Like within that first hour, same goes with DiCaprio. Like DiCaprio wants to become a cop, so to speak, and the only way to do that is become an undercover cop for for working for the uh, Boston, Massachusetts police, and Damon. He just wants to be to have a job where he's able to live uh, in like a fancy house and uh, obviously be a state trooper, but also be you know looking out and seeing the capital of, of Boston as well outside his apartment complex. Like that's what he wants to to do. And Scorsese does a really good job establishing that really well visually without having to overstate it within the dialogue of like their their needs and their wants and their desires of the uh, of their characters really well um and Scorsese, says he's he's always so good at this and i i agree with you what, what you said earlier like scorsese is one of the best filmmakers we have because he's not typically the type of director that offers sentimentality um or be very uh, uh whimsical like spielberg is or some of these other directors and he tries not to force to spoon feed you all the information there is uh and he sort of leaves the audience you know, feeling very conflicted, especially with like the the over the top gory violence in his films, and uh, contrasting that with a lot of uh, uh, experimental editing. And he does this even in in stuff like good you know Goodfellas, Raging Bull, Casino, uh, and even with Killers of the Flower Moon to a certain degree. He he has he still has that adoptive nature. It's just that now he's at a point you know past he's now at a point past the departed where he's a much more reserved and subdued filmmaker um but he's still you know he's still he's still got the moves man yeah um so a couple of things there's your shot of Wahlberg. Right, Wahlberg. That, yep yeah so i mean i'll get to him in a minute because there's something else you know i i didn't know this until um I actually read about this. Okay. So there was a, a line for after graduation, everybody is established, so to speak. So basically Matt Damon says to actually one of his other, we find out later that it was a rat for Costello. He's like, well, do you want to just, do you want to rise up in the, in the state police or do you want to, you know, wear a uniform that, you know, invade, you look like you invade Poland. And of course, I didn't realize this. So he's talking about and this is true, guys. I didn't realize this. But the state police, and I looked into this, the state police uniforms from Massachusetts were actually modeled after SS cards. Yep. And yep. he says to the colleague, Do you like coming to work every day like you're going to invade Poland? And I went, Whoa. <laughs> It's yeah, definitely. That was that'll be something that'll get you canceled in a heartbeat today. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm yeah, like, they, I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I couldn't believe that. I and the other thing too that helps with the script is that you have someone like William Monahan, who's from Boston, who grew up directly where this movie is in, and it helps that because of his I intuition and his knowledge of the city and of the streets, so to speak it allowed him to create a story. It allowed him to take the infernal affairs story, right. And adapt it into a modern Boston, Massachusetts area. Uh, and, you know, also adapting the whole element of the uh, whitey bulger scenario where he's like a, a crooked, you know, he's a gangster that's working right. an FBI informant. Um, obviously the outcome for whitey bulger is very different to what happens with Frank uh, Costello. Cause Frank Costello got shot 
And Whitey Bulger got arrested by the police. And right, as exactly. of this recording, he didn't he didn't get shot by the police, but he got arrested. Mm-hmm. Um and uh yeah, but but still though, like that's that's something that really helps. And as writers, we're always told to to write what you know. And and that's what William Hanahan did yeah. in the script. Even even adding that little detail about the 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 st- uh you know police uniforms. The uniforms. Um so I so truth be told, about a year, maybe yeah, it's been about a year. I sat down with a screenwriter, and by the way, guys, I will upload this video today at some point. And his favorite movie is The Departed. And mm. so one of the questions that I asked him was, Do you think the the vulgarity? Because look, a lot of people have one thing that Scorsese does not shy from away from is language. It doesn't matter if it's casino. It doesn't matter if it's Goodfellas. It doesn't matter what it is. And I asked Brad at the time, do you think the vulgarity had a, people have a problem with that? And he basically said no, because that's how they actually talk. Yeah. And to your point about, you know, having somebody who is from the city of Boston and writing the way they talk, because you can tell when somebody is talking like they are in a bullpen, and then how it gets watered down or made up or sugar-coated. And you're like, this isn't how that... And what ends up happening at that point is they become un, that character becomes unbelievable. Yeah. And so that's one good thing about, you know, he, he didn't pull any punches with it. Now, let me dive in a little bit more about this. Let's talk about Monaghan's win. Because what did you think about his win in general with the year that was out there? And I don't even know. Refresh everybody's memory about what actually got nominated that year. So the nominees for Adapted Screenplay that year were <laughs> – I will be covering this movie on my podcast. And I actually will be talking about this uh, category more on my own channel, the Lone Screenplay nominee down the road. Uh, but the nominees were Blorak Cultural Learnings for of America for Make Benefit, Glorious Nation of Kazakhstan. Uh, so that got nominated for Adapted Screenplay alongside Children of Men, Little Children, and Notes on a Scandal. Now, this was an easy win for The Departed because even though uh, even though The Departed had lost the Golden Globe and Critics' Choice to Little Miss Sunshine, which was the original screenplay winner, BAFTA decided to go with a non-Oscar nominee that year. They went with The Last King of Scotland, um, which is really shocking because I guess it just showed you how much strength Forrest Whitaker had that year with lead actor. Like, no matter what, he was going to win it. Sorry, DiCaprio, you get your Oscar down the road. Will Smith will get his Oscar down the road. And Peter O'Toole, yeah, you're, you're going to get, like, no, you're going to get no wins in your entire career. And he is currently the... Uh, the high, the most nominated actor to not win an Oscar, uh, Peter O'Toole, that is. Sorry, buddy. Um, so, yeah, so it was pretty easy for The Departed to win the Adapted Screenplay Oscar, especially when it, it, it had the Writers Guild of America Award as well. And it helped that it was the only Best Picture nominated film in a lineup of non-Best Picture nominees. And it's funny, too, because this is the only film from Scorsese to have won a writing Oscar, period. Like, none of Scorsese's other films that he has directed, uh, or produced for that matter, have won the screenplay prizes. Like, Hugo never won screenplay, uh, The Irishman never won screenplay, and same thing with uh, Gangs of New York and The Aviator. Um and it, it was just such it, it, it really was such an easy like okay like we already know that yeah, it, it. it was a slam dunk it was a slam dunk and, and it also helped too that it was a it, it was a sign early well i mean we already knew ahead of time that score says he was going to win this and we'll, i'll get into why he won director uh maybe later on in the show um and it's yeah it just it's you know the adaptive screenplay tends to go to films that have a lot of uh uh, quippier, uh, you know, one-liner uh, kind of, right. of writing uh, in terms of their dialogue. Sharp writing, if you Sharp will. writing, yeah. And we even saw this uh, this past year when I warned you 
American fiction was going to win for adapted and you, screenplay. And you were right about that. I was and, right. I, you and were it's right. because it was, you know, and ten, and typically in a, in a lineup where, uh, not that this was like a, a competitive year to begin with, but usually when you're in a lineup where you're not really sure, you know, let's say hypothetically the other nominees were de- nominated for Best Picture, right? Let's just pretend mm-hmm. for a second Borat, Children of Men, Little right, right, Children, right. and Don't Send the Scandal got in for Best Picture. They typically go with the film that has a uh, an audience uh, like what's the most broadly told movie with an audience gener- you know audience friendly film that appeals to the Academy voters and especially with the way the story is told. This is gonna be it. Like Notes on the Scandal and Little Children is just too complex for the 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 people you know the voters. Borat was not gonna win screen was not even gonna win screenplay because it's not even <laughs> How the type of film that wins. we won't know. Um Yuki but, says I lost my Oscar ballot. Thanks, American fiction. Well, but yeah, yeah. no, I mean um, it's it's one of those things where so there are a couple other things here that um I really liked about this film. Um <clears throat> East I won't say they're Easter eggs, but they make it full circuit. So in the beginning, um you know, we see Costello come in and basically um, get some money from one of the shop owners. And he's able to actually, you know, he gets all these groceries from, uh, you know, he gives all these groceries to Matt Damon's character. And yeah. so when Digman shoots him here at the end uh, to finish things full circle, everything that, I don't know if you knew this or you didn't know this, but for anybody out there that has seen the film, you may not have picked up on this. Everything that was in the bag at the beginning of the film was in the same was in the bag there when he got shot at the end of the film. Yep. It's also so, the same convenience store where uh both uh Billy and Colin uh met Frank in some in some capacity. Um uh, you know, with the case of like, and even the way they're interacting with, you know, Frank in some way, shape, or form, like Co- uh, Colin and Frank talk to each other like father and son. That's how the relationship is like, father and son. Speaking of, yeah, and, go ahead. And even with uh, with Billy, Billy does it because he wants to instigate and sort of get Frank's eyes onto him. And by doing that, he has to rough up these two guys who are there to collect money for, right. uh, for you know, Frank Costello yeah. or, you know, or something. Um, and that's how he gets eyes on the, on the, uh, this Billy kid. And he's like, what the hell is this Billy kid doing? And he does the whole, you know, search yeah. thing with like, so like, you know, any wires. actually a couple of other things I really enjoyed about this. What the, maybe was just a scene, but I thought the lighting there was done really well. As we see here, this is the, so what this, and the, I'll show you the, the, the wider shot here in a minute, but what the red is basically saying to me and I, here's the wide shot of it, mm-hmm. is that he is, Costello is like the devil. Pretty much. I mean, you know, it's basically like, and the, you know, he is, the, the light red basically says, hey, look, I'm evil. I'm the devil. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when we see it, you know, the red and the black actually do very well together. You know, the black in the suit, and then the red in the background does very well. Um, so that was something that I noticed too. Um, the other thing too is one of the characters, you know, we were talking about him earlier, Billy. He experiences a lot of loss yeah. throughout this whole film. So that that is his mother, okay? And then, you know, he has a conversation with, obviously, I would imagine his uncle or, you know, that's his sister that's, you know, and basically he not only sees this, but later on, okay, um, we get the fact that, you know, when Queenie dies and he gets thrown off the roof, like yeah. he never really had a father figure. And that's why he was so beat up about that, okay, is when Queenie gets thrown off the roof and he sees him there. And just he goes splat, yeah, right on the uh, on the pavement. He he is mortified because not only is he his handler and he's his, you know, but at the same time, 
that's the closest of a father figure he's ever going to have. And exactly. it's now gone. And it's, you know, I mean, it's kind of hard to see, but if we, you know, top left-hand corner guys, I mean, forget about the exit for a minute. He gets thrown off the roof. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, he just turns the corner and. Boom. It's, it's kind of a shocking moment it's, when you watch yeah. it the first time around, you're like, holy shit. And yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty big. Um, and Martin Sheen does a really good job with that role too. Uh, I can't remember how they got him exactly. It might've been a case of Martin Sheen just wanted to work with Scorsese for years. And he's like, I'll do any role and I'll, I'll be in on this uh, period. So he was like, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll get him in for this. Uh, the other thing I should also bring up with the cinematographer, uh, Michael Ballhouse is this was his last film. He had worked with Martin Scorsese on uh, because afterwards uh, Martin Scorsese had worked with uh, uh, Robert Richardson on uh, a couple other film, a couple other films together, including Hugo. And then now his go-to director photographer or DP is um, Rodrigo Prieto which okay. he had worked recently on for the Irishman and kill was the flower moon. Um, oh. and, and Michael ball house passed away at like 81 in 2017, I think. Um, but, but he had a really good career. You know, he's worked with Scorsese on this. I'm pretty sure they worked together on gangs, New York. And it might, I think the other film they worked on together was raging bull. If, uh, no, that was someone else. Okay. But anyways, um, um, something yeah. else I noticed too, Okay, and we were just talking about the lighting to show you how evil he was and whatever else. So within the first, you don't see Costello's face in the first five minutes of the film. Until he does that reveal. Right. So, I mean, forget about the X there over there, but you're only hearing his voice. Mm -hmm. And really, that just shows you, by the way, the, how they did that is just amazing and the DP and everything else. But nonetheless, like, this is just showing you another immediately within the first five minutes. This is saying, okay, this guy is no good. Okay. This guy's evil. He's no good and everything else. And basically just putting him in the darkness, complete darkness. I mean, sometimes when we see like, you know, half lit, half not debating if this guy is going to turn type of thing, but he is completely in the dark there. And that really, until he steps out in the light, which is five minutes in, then we see his face. And then, you know, as he says, you know, when you have a loaded gun to your head, it just, you know, doesn't What's really matter. What's the difference? Mm -hmm. And so that was the first reveal of Costello, but it was really well done in how they, how they did that. Um, the other thing, and I don't have a picture for this, but the camera movements, some of the camera yeah. movements they do, like, for example, the, the one I wrote down is when Dickman and LMB, or LMB, okay, played by um, Alec Baldwin, are talking about the microprocessors and how they just move. And, you know, to basically show dramatic effect. Yeah. And to, to show that, you know, this is a serious thing. And how they did that in both, both ways was just fantastic. I love, um, I love, yeah, right. I, I did want to say, I, I love that Michael Proce the microprocessor scene where they're with the whole, uh, you're talking about the Chinese deal, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. The, the Chinese deal. I, I, I love that scene. Uh, well, well, two things. One, uh, I just, I love the tension of it throughout because you're not really sure whether or not, uh, Costello and the gang are going to get caught and whether or not Damon's character, uh, Colin is going to get, uh, caught too, because, He's, you know, he, you know, at the last minute, he's being asked to run the players and, you know, to, to be on the lookout and such. And they got to use a surveillance camera, which someone fucked up by placing them in the wrong places. And it, it kind of starts the ball rolling a little bit into what eventually will be our, you know, second half of the film, you know, especially with Mark Wahlberg, you know, as he's, you know, eyeing around, he's looking around and he's, and you, and it's clear I, the way I saw it was, he started noticing Colin with his hands in his pocket. He starts moving around. Well, and then like, go ahead and finish it. That's a perfect segue and, for what I'm going to say. And and the other thing I loved about it was the reaction. But I love the, there's so many quotable lines from this. You know, like Mark Wahlberg with his performance, where he's like, "Yeah, why the fuck did they turn their phones off?" You yeah, know? Okay. And he's like, "Oh, so, I'm, I'm, I'm the guy who does his job. You must be the other guy." That, um, yeah. And that just leads me right into now. You got to understand, guys. This is 2007. 
We don't have smartphones. Okay. No. The iPhone hasn't been developed yet. So <laughs> anybody who knows what I'm talking about and had one of these flip phones back in the day, you know, mind you, this isn't a BlackBerry. Okay. No. But anybody who didn't have a BlackBerry back in the day or he had a, they had a flip phone knows exactly what I'm talking about. Anybody who tried to text um, and you and you missed the letter, you had to go all the way back to the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Okay? And the funny thing is, so what you were just talking about, the deal, okay? Basically, um, Paul Pilot for the win, yes, definitely. <laughs> but, um, but nonetheless, like anybody who didn't have it, it – it's something very minor to overlook, but it's one of those things where he's not looking, right? No. He's not looking at his phone and he's texting, you know, no phones. Now that's seven or eight characters and you have to get everything right. And then it hits send and it's like, uh, okay. <laughs> it's a little... <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm willing to, there, I'm willing yeah. to bite, you know, stretch it a little I, bit for you. I don't know. There, there's much worse things in, in terms of films, and it's like, you know, like the, the stretches the imagination. <laughs> that one I'm, I'm willing to forgive. Um, uh, but uh, the other thing I do love about that scene is I love Alec Baldwin's performance, which uh, I'm talking about the performance, by the way, not the. Yeah. Um, I, I love that per, the the performance he gives in that scene, especially with that at the beginning. He's like, "All right, yes, I love I love you know intelligence. I love it. I love it. We're gonna catch the guy." And then as the progresses, he's like, "Oh Jesus Christ! Please tell me he's in that car." Yeah, you know, and, he, and he's yeah, like, "Somebody's driving that car." No, absolutely. Yeah, and, then he, and he bring and he drags the guy who like fucked up the the camera work. Yeah, you know, can I talk to you for a minute? What left. the yeah, he you just know? slaps him and beats the shit out of him. I, I love that scene so much. But uh, uh but, so but yeah, this it's, is it's where it gets scene. interesting though. Yeah, this is where it gets interesting. Go ahead. The other Finish thing I want to bring up, and I brought this up right before Oppenheimer won Best Picture. I find it so funny, and I think you know what I'm talking about. Um, I find it so funny that we live in a world where Christopher Nolan and Martin Scorsese, the top the one time they finally got their overdue wins were for films that starred Matt Damon in the role, and at least one character said the line in this country. Yeah. It's such like a weird, like yeah. I know it's like and, it's like not much like, yeah, whatever, it's just a throwaway line. But it's just it's so weird that, that it's happened twice, you yeah. know? Uh anyways, going back to what you were saying. No, so this is where it really starts to get interesting. So I think there are two kinds of movies. There there are two movies here. So once he gets thrown off the roof and then Matt Damon basically has to figure out how to get in contact with the guy. Yeah. I think it's a cat and mouse game now. So he picks up the phone and he dials the number. Yeah. Okay. And he gets him on the other line. And what you're seeing and it's beautiful. It's just silence. I mean, it's not even breath. It's just silence. Dead silence. You're like, who's going to play first? Yeah. And then, boom. And then he's pacing back and forth. And then he calls him again. Yeah. And that's when, this is when the cat and mouse thing really starts to come into play. And it's like a whole second movie at this point. Yeah, okay? it does. And once that happens, then the walls start slowly closing in. Mm -hmm. And... You know, I mean, there's that scene, excuse me, later on when, you know, they pull the, the tail off of Costello because he's going to a Coke buy um, or, or later on in the film. But they pull the tail off of him. Nonetheless, it, it's just one of those things. So now you have, now that that, now the queen is dead, okay, now it's a cat and mouse game. Now it's two different, we've got Leo We've got Billy and we've got the other guy. And how are they going to end up meeting? So one of them calls and be like, look, come in. We'll, you know, we'll pay you. We'll take care of you, you know. And so that's when Leo goes in and he's like, you know, well, we were trying to figure out what your, how to get you your personnel files. He's like, oh, this is my name. Yeah. He's like, oh, it's your name. That's smart. Yeah. <laughs> 
So, of course, that's the cheesiest thing in the world, right? So he go, he's like, yeah, I, I got to go in the other room. So he goes in the other room and he's, you know, getting all the stuff together. And he notices the, and I don't have, I'll bring it up in another picture, but the, if we look over here in the top left-hand corner, okay, it's kind of hard the to see, but the citizens, citizens. Yeah. This, he's like, so that, he notices it on his desk. And he also knows that, hey, look, this is the, this is what I wrote. So he's the fucking rat. One thing I, so, yeah. yeah. The one thing I always love about Scris, uh, what I love about Chris is he's directing, at least in his films, is that he creates tension without having to be over reliant on music cues. Even if he does, it's it's hardly noticeable, or it's not as you know noticeable as you know other films would do it. Like the moment there's another scene in the film where Billy t- c- talks to Costigan at the restaurant, and he's you know he has that like that whole drawing. Which did you even notice what uh, Costigan was? Uh, uh, Frank Cost- uh, Costello was. Uh, 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 drawing. Is this the? Is this where I think we're we're agreeing well, we have a rat scene? Yeah, he's like I smell a rat, yeah. and he's like spills yeah. the whole wine on it. It. Yeah. He's he's drawing a picture of rats, like running all the way to the like the to the main capital. Um, mm-hmm. but it's but it's like even during that scene, it's like there is a music cue in it, but it's so it it's hardly noticeable in the film, and it's like it's stuff like that where it's Scorsese is so good at doing. And he doesn't spoon feed the audience because it's like, why would he? Um, but what's great is that like this is this is like a story that he's a story for for Scorsese that he's actually able to do without that relies on his tricks as a filmmaker, you know, mostly good uh, tricks that is, and it uses and it's used to his advantages for a story like this. Um, it's also funny that <laughs> even Scorsese said jokingly when he won the Oscar for. Uh, director and picture uh he you know he probably won it because it was the first film to actually have a plot uh so <laughs> like his other films are very much like you know uh you know a bit all over the place and such in terms yeah. of story but um but yeah and uh yeah but no there, there's there's a lot in here to admire and yeah like i said that scene with with him with uh billy finding out that you know uh, Frank Costello's mole was Damon's character, and it's like that's a really intense moment. And even that editing trick that uh, Thelma Schoonmaker, who got her third mm-hmm. Oscar by the way for this film, uh, and I, I do want to actually talk about some of the Oscar wins in, in yeah. a little bit if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, and the, the editing t- techniques that Thelma used for this is really great. And uh, funny enough, it's actually this was a scene that was showcase to us uh in film class uh in terms of like how to create like really good tension building and and even just the an example of like a a, a quick cuts you know and smash cuts so to speak and uh or you know and it's it's pretty good yeah and it, it it just it works all the way around and so once you have that that is you know like i said it's a game of cat and mouse and then you have the therapist who's caught in the middle and you know he basically goes billy goes to him and like look you know if if i disappear or if something should happen to me you know open this mm-hmm. and that's how she finds out that he is the rat um but yeah i mean and and, and there's by a, the way there, that yeah. rat is cgi i, I mean yeah. obviously it has been it way is. too difficult it, but yeah yeah, I mean, and Scorsese, Scorsese, just you know, just all right. One time you get to do this, you know, very on the nose kind of symbolism. Okay, you, you know, do it one time and that's it. Um, yeah. And but, uh, the uh, the other thing I should mention is that there are theories going around, or at least you know, because it's not clearly stated to us as to how uh, Mark Wahlberg's character finds out that Damon is the mole. You know, because there are a couple ways you can interpret that. Uh, one could be obviously the fact that. Uh, Billy informed. Uh, well, don't forget, uh, guys. Was... And to your point, just a, just a side note: when he gets, um, when Queen dies, okay, yeah. and so they are, you know, Matt Damon's character wants basically to get to all of his files, but he can't. He basically, so they have a, they go at it. They go to fist cuffs, yeah. and. So Baldwin sends him 
on uh, administrative leave for two weeks. So, you know, so he disappears. So at that point, when <clears throat> Leo tries to call in and be like, hey, look, I want to talk to Queen in, I want to talk to Digman to verify it. And he's like, well, no, he, he's gone for, he was put on administrative leave. Yeah. Now, the prevailing theory, he's a cop. He could do digging, you know, he, he could, if you really wanted to, you know, dig into it, he could easily very, very, very well find out that, you know, put the pieces of the puzzle together. That's just to your point. What do you think? There's two theories I think of. One, I really do think the the first one uh, could be the fact that the uh, even though Leo's character had told Anthony Anderson's character to bring Dignam with him to go to the you know the abandoned site, the rooftop, um, the rooftop, yeah. And I think Dignam was smart enough to be like, okay, I'm you know either he was told or he wasn't. But at least he, you know, the theory could be the fact that like, okay, I'm going to, even though I'm, I could go, I'm not, but I will, but, and it might've been one of those cases where it's like, whoever gets out of that place alive is the rat. Um, you know, because just in case, you know, he found out about the rat and was like, oh, I'm going to end up getting killed in the process, you know, whatever he, his thought, th- uh, thought process was. The other theory, which I think is a little bit more plausible is the fact that uh, Vera Farmiga, what she had in the envelope was obviously all the information to say, if anything happens to me, uh, re- you know, give all this information that I've discovered that uh, damage the mole and they need to give this to Dignum. Um, and, you know, through Dignum, uh, or, you know, the Mark Wahlberg character, the, he was able to get to Mark, uh, to Matt Damon's apartment because she had a key to his, uh, to his place and was able to stage, you know, his, you know, was able to stage a murder there. Uh, hence why he has like the, the covered up uh, uh, boots and even like the, the, you know, tracker suit. And then even has like the scully cap as well. So he could just walk out of there, uh, you know, there like know. it was, you know, like, you know, it was like a random murder. And, uh, and it's, <laughs> it's a great scene with like, when he walks in, he sees the feet and then he sees Mark Wahlberg's character with yeah. the, the silencer and he's like okay like he's just accepted yeah. his fate you know yeah. he's like all right like, here we go so um yeah i mean it's just and you kind of had you kind of knew right i mean you kind of knew he was gonna die he had to die yeah um, because you know because for him to go on through the story and be alive and not die? Just be, something yeah something was gonna be wrong yeah, because because again, you, you know, you you're sort of you're paying the consequences for your actions. You're paying the piper, you know, or giving the the devil his due for your actions that you've done throughout the film. And uh, yeah, that's that's yeah, that's how I it mean, happened. It's just, um, yeah, and so this is that. I think this is the one scene. I mean, this is just a still from it, but this is that one scene that you know, everybody remembers mm. is, you know, the, you know, when he's sitting at the restaurant, the bar, and he's talking with, you know, Billy, and he's like, look, the first time you do it, fine. The second time you threaten me, I quit. You, yeah. f- you make me fear for my life. I'll put a bullet in your head so fast your head would spin. And yeah. the gun drops. And he's like, oh, is there something you want to tell me? You know, yeah, and and that that, that moment with that was with, uh, Yeah, and what's funny is that that moment with uh, Nicholson pointing the gun at DiCaprio that was improvised. That, that was, was a real not, gun. It was a real gun, and real gun. DiCaprio was not expecting that moment to you know like a gun being pointed at him. So his reaction was very genuine. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's yeah. it's it's a, yeah, it's it's. It, it, I, I, yeah, but go ahead if if you had any other comments you want no, to say. No, I was just going to say that this is this was just a a fantastic, well done, unbelievable movie. Um, yeah, I mean we can go on now. I know you did say you wanted to talk about the um, the Oscar. Oscar wins. Like, so let's let's yeah. talk about the Oscar wins real quick. So. Uh, I, I will say this based on my edit, my research for editing, even though some may think that this was a clear cut 
uh like oh you know it's so obviously going to be the departed for editing i remember Babel actually did take a bit of a fight for editing because it, even though they had both lost the bafta for editing to united 93 which was nominated the oscars um as well Babel wasn't you know Babel and the departed tied at the ace editors guild for dramatic added editing but uh the de- unlike Babel, the departed was such a queer you know queer cut front runner to win best picture that and it was also going to win director as well so it just seemed really weird to have like Babel just take home editing and score as well which also score was going to happen because of how divided that whole field was i mean we could do a whole oscar prognosis and, and hmm. analysis on what happened that year because it's because there there was some interesting stuff i found out last night that i'm like holy shit how did this happen that i'll I'll have to tell you off air. Um, as far as the director win for Scorsese, look, this was about as clear cut as it was going to be. He did exactly what Scorsese, what Nolan did, in which he made a film. Well, first off, he stopped. You know, gangs. You know, unlike Gangs of New York and The Aviator, he stopped actually trying to make a film that was such a clear awards baity, like give me the Oscar kind of movie. Yeah. Um, and he did a, a general audience appealing film. And he appealed to the to the masses. It was a box office hit worldwide, and it appealed to the snobby voters. And it also helped too that he had no competition, none. Mm-hmm. Like he was up against Babel, uh, Letters from Iwo Jima, The Queen, and United ninety three. There was no way that anyone else was going to win, even though United ninety three did win the BAFTA. They gave it because they like <laughs> they do like Paul Greengrass as a filmmaker. Um, especially when next year, when they decided to give that the Bourne Ultimatum more award nominations than the Oscars. So, anyways, but The Departed was going to win. It was going to win, and and what also helped too is that he, outside of him having no competition, much like Nolan, he had the overdue factor. It was mm-hmm. the we we have to give him the award this time. There's no way to avoid this. It's unavoidable, and anyone who doesn't want to vote for him. Uh, it was a slam like, dunk here, all it's the a way slam home. Dunk. There was not one yeah. time where he was not going to win the Oscar. Yeah, and for anyone who didn't want to vote for his movie or hated it, him for whatever reason within the Academy, I, I'd have to assume they they just gave him like a firing squad treatment to be like, yeah, you're not voting for Scorsese. Yeah, you're you're yeah. going up against the wall. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but like, but that that was one reason. And then the other thing about Best Picture is that even though it had, uh, I'm looking through my other notes here. Um, even though it did not win the Producers Guild, the BAFTA, or the Golden Globe, or didn't even win SAG Ensemble, The Departed was expected to win, and because it was such a clear-cut favorite for director, and it was like, okay, spl- having a split for director and picture back then was not as often as it was in the 2010s or even now. Um, so it, pr- it seemed pretty clear that, that The Departed was going to win. You know, The other films in the lineup, like Babel was too divisive to win Best Picture, and it only won score. The Queen was lauded for Helen Mirren's performance, but not much else was singled out for a competitive win. What is Free with Jima was respected by the older branch of the Academy, but they just gave their second round of flowers to Clint Eastwood's film for Million Dollar Baby a couple years ago. Um, and Little Miss Sunshine was probably the likely runner-up for Best Picture, as it did win the Producers Guild of America Award and the Screen Actors uh, Guild Ensemble Award. Um, and it also scored two Oscars for Alan Arkin for supporting actor and original screenplay, but without having any film editing nomination and not much passion to overpower The Departed, it couldn't be the first film to premiere at Sundance and win Best Picture, which is something that Coda managed to do years later. Uh, I should also point out The Departed up until Oppenheimer, The Departed was the last film to win Best Picture without a festival prize. That's how you do that they weren't even trying to get this for Oscars until after it was done. And sometimes that's really all it is. It's like, there's no competition. You you have an overdue narrative. You made a really well, a well-made, uh, financially successful film. And this is your your moment. This is your chance to, yeah. to you know, be It was a slam dunk. dunk. Yeah, and exactly. At, at the end of the day, it was a slam dunk. I mean, some years, you know, we can pronosticate we can debate we can predict or try to at least and like well this has a chance or that has a chance and you know these are dark horses 
this year, and when I say this year, I mean 08, this year, and then of course in 2023, 2024, 2023, 2024, yeah. this last Oscar run, there yeah, was the just no doubt. There was just no yeah. doubt. I mean, it yeah, was for just and director, yeah. all the way home going to win. And yeah, I mean, there's one of the. There's one other question I want to ask you before I give my yeah. two cents on it. Do you have a theory as to why out of all the ensemble, out of all the actors in the film, why Mark Wahlberg got in? Because I have a theory. Yeah. But as I a matter of fact, I, I was going to ask you, I'll, I would even I'll raise you this question. You have three guys there that are pictures that are not even, maybe they didn't com- campaign. I, I don't no, know. I, but I mean, I, all I, three guys yeah. in that photograph... They're not, and granted, Wahlberg's a supporting character, but they're not, they, not one of them got nominated. So I I have a theory. Okay, So with the case of Damon, he was just never going to get nominated for the performance. It's really good, but he doesn't, he hasn't gotten an acting nomination since, I think it was Good Will Hunting, and then he didn't get another acting nod until Invictus um, for supporting actor. Um, DiCaprio, that was a case of DiCaprio wanted, like originally Warner Brothers was actually going to campaign him for, uh, for the, the departed, but he wanted to get mentioned or singled out for blood diamond more because mm-hmm. that was, I guess the more like showier performance. What we're going to do is this, um, I just wanted to, well, um, I just want to bring up a couple of things. Um, First of all, thank you for everybody that stuck with us for the whole hour and 10 minutes when we're not done. I have one more thing I would like to cover. Um, and um, so that being said, um, once again, thank you for, sorry about that, guys. Thank you for everybody that has stuck with us for the past hour and change. There is one more thing I want to cover, though. Um, for, I Let me just quickly give my last two two cents about this film and then we're gonna i want to head into one of my last segments this is a remark this is why i'm doing it for perfect movies there isn't a false note here okay this isn't scorsese for all the films he's done okay i'm talking you know mind you i've been watching this whole film often but when i'm i mean you know you're talking about mean streets goodfellas casino you know it runs the gamut okay I mean, dating all the way back to Last Temptation of Christ. Anyways, this was, there were a lot of different things. First and foremost, as Matt made mention, okay, there, there was no competition. There was zero competition, so you knew he was going to do it. The second is, there was the overdue factor. Third is, this is a hell of a movie. It really is. If you guys haven't seen The Departed, okay, it's been out for 16 years, go see it. If you have seen it, sit down and watch it again. Maybe there's something you pick up on, like the X's, okay, that maybe you didn't pick up on before. I love sitting down and watching movies that, you know, I've seen over and over. Not because they're boring, but because there might be something else I'm picking. I missed the first time. Trust me, there have been, I've done that before, okay? All that being said, this is what a perfect movie is. It encompasses everything. The acting, okay? the directing, the lighting. I showed this to you earlier. You have pivotal, pivotal scenes. As I said before, this is the one scene that everybody remembers, okay? The acting between these two, okay? You have a powerhouse against an upcoming powerhouse. Fantastic, okay? Um, It's just so well done in so many different ways. And I think that, that this was going to do well and that's why it went four out of the five so this is why for me it's a perfect movie matt would agree and this is my next addition to the perfect movie series okay guys thank you for that little so the last thing that i like to close with every single time i stream or put out a video and As I said before, I'm sorry about the amount of content because I am a working man, okay? I I do have a job, but I am trying to make this my full-time gig. And memberships. 
They say, oh, God, he's going to ask me for money. Yes and no. Yes and no. So the reason I'm, I'm talking to you guys about this is because if you look at this, okay, it is completely free. Okay. It is completely 100% free. Okay. Um, what I am trying to do, obviously, is build a channel. But the reason why I'm doing this, the first month I'm giving to you is completely free. Okay. Um, now, I have three levels. Okay. The first, and I've made this super, super cheap, guys. The first level is $2.99. That's almost a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Okay. Or it's a, a drink there. The next one is $6.99, five or $6.99. Okay, that's a gallon of gas, depending on where you are in the country. Okay, and my highest is $9.99. Now, let me go through these real quick. Okay, the reason why I, I want to talk to you about this is because, like, HBO Max is $9.99 with ads. Excuse me. Netflix is about to raise their prices again. Okay. Hulu is cracking down on their password sharing. Okay. I'm giving all this content to you for 10 bucks a month. Okay. That is the perfect movie series, which you're watching today. Okay. That is the retrospectives. Okay. Which I have a ton of retrospectives ready to rock and roll for April. Okay. Including things like Batman. You know, I'm going to go see the Dark Knight on the 10th. I'm going to do a whole stream. I got to talk to him again, but I'm going to do a whole stream about, you know, the Dark Knight with Phil with uh, Phil Walsh. He's going to come back in the show, so I'm going to have guests. Um, you know, Anatomy of a Movie. I'm working on the next, the next uh, Anatomy of a Movie video, which is going to be on Heat, coffee shop scene, all interviews. Okay, uh, I was just talking to last week and landed. We have to, yet to set up a date. Um, Robert Byron Burnett, okay? Um, all of these different things, okay? 10 bucks a month is nothing. Now, if you never want to subscribe to 10 bucks a month, that's cool. Three bucks a month is great, okay? That all being said, okay, I have goals, okay? I would like to do this full-time, okay? The only way I can do this full-time is um by with your help okay so what i would a couple of things number one i say to you this okay join for the first month it's completely free it won't cost you a dime okay if you don't like the content if you don't think i'm putting out enough content for you guys okay please please don't i don't want to take your money cancel okay if in fact you do think that it is good worthy fantastic content continue to stay joined what that will do is two things number one it will help me out dramatically and number two i will be able to grow the channel even more okay i do have goals the first goal i want to reach 2,000 subscribers by the end of this year hashtag road to 2000 okay um and the other goal is i'd like to try and get between 15 to 20 paid memberships by the end of this year which i think is completely doable and possible okay now if you don't do anything if you don't want to join that's completely fine i have no problem with that but hit the like and subscribe button okay because what that does is that puts it out for other people to watch, okay? And I want this content to go out to as many people as I can view it, okay? And that all being said, I have fantastic retrospectives coming up this month. I'm going to be doing a Nightmare on Elm Street, 40th year anniversary of Nightmare on Elm Street. We've got to have draft day, okay? Kevin Costner and... Uh, Jennifer Garner, a little, you know, fancy, not a fantasy, but, but it's a football movie. Okay. We got Batman. Okay. I got Charlie's Angels. 
the one from 2019. I love that movie. Elizabeth Banks, love that movie. I'm going to do me a retrospective about that. Not to mention, guys, I'm going to be covering all of the newer movies. So we have A24 Civil War coming out. I'm going to be doing a spoiler cast on that. Starting the 15th, okay, I'm going to be covering every single Spider-Man movie, okay? I've taken the days off of work, and I'm going to be calling what I call Spidey Streams, okay? April 16th, you guys can expect a Spider-Man stream from t- what I've, I haven't seen in years, so I can't wait to see it. In 2002, the Sam Raimi, Tobey Maguire, Kirsten Dunst, Spider-Man movie. The next week, Spider-Man 2, and so on. All the way through June 6th, guys. All the way through June 6th. Okay? And being able to go back and re-watch those movies. So those, okay? Not to mention all of the other things I've talked about. Okay? I can't do this without your support. Okay? And I'm trying, I've made this as cheap as possible. And I'm putting out as much as I can. I have so many ideas for the channel, guys. Okay? But I can't do it without your help. And as I said before, if nothing else, hit that like and subscribe button. Okay? But what I would say is this. The last thing I'll say is this. Join for a month. It's not going to cost you a dime. Okay? If you don't think you're getting all the content you want, Go ahead and cancel. You're not going to hurt my feelings. Okay? But if you do, stick with me. Because we got a whole summer coming up. Okay? I'm talking about Furiosa. I'm talking about The Fall Guy. I'm talking about Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. A ton of movies. Okay? Not to mention you have movies like Joker 2 at the end of the year. I'm going to be covering all these movies, guys. Okay? So, yeah. Um... And that is, that's going to do it. Um, I Once again, for all those that have been watching, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate you guys sticking with me for an hour and 20 minutes. These are, this is a, has been a, usually a little bit longer because I did have Matt on. He had some uh, technical difficulties, so we had to say goodbye to him. Go check him out, though. Go check out the Lone uh, Oscar Screenplay podcast. It's very good. And, uh, So basically, that is a podcast that only the um, only the screenplay got nominated. So that's all he covers, just the one screenplay. So go check that out. His stuff's very good as well. Um, So what's up next? So I've already sat down and watched Batman. Okay, I'm gonna sit down. It's one thirty right now. I'm gonna sit down and watch Charlie's Angels today. Hopefully get that pre-recorded and get that out, you know, ready for you guys this week. Um, as I said, all of those retrospectives are going to be coming to you this month at some point. And uh, yeah. So with all that being said, though, um, there are three things I tell everybody to do every single time I head off the air. And I want to say them right now to everybody. Number one, be safe no matter what you're doing. Number two, be careful. And three, most importantly, guys, be good to one another. So that's going to do it for me. I'm David Steele. Matthew Anderson was glad to join us. And I will see everybody later. So that's going to do it. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye.